Good evening and welcome to the July Tri-County Sustainability General Meeting. We are the hub for the 101 towns, 10 legislative districts, and 1.2 million residents of Burlington, Camden, and Gloucester counties. My name is Chelsea Gittle from the Oakland Green Team, and we have a great program tonight. A little bit about me. Uh, in my current role, I work as a professional uh, project manager for a certified B Corp environmental and engineering consulting firm. I have over 15 years of experience in the environmental industry covering everything from environmental site assessments, due diligence, soil, groundwater investigation, stormwater management, permitting, habitat monitoring, drinking water, and so on. Um, some of my personal interests include traveling, art, vermicomposting, my 13 and a half year old dog, and gardening. Uh, I was born and raised in New Jersey, but after graduating from Rutgers, I have lived different places across the United States from tiny isolated isol isol towns of 1,000 people with no cell service uh, to the major metropolitan of New York City. Since returning to South Jersey a few years ago, I've become passionate about applying what I've learned from the different places I've lived and traveled combined with my education and professional work to be able to contribute to advancing sustainability here in New Jersey, especially by working with the Oakland Green Team where I've organized our monthly White Horse Pike litter cleanups, spotted lantern fly egg scraping, community fundraising for beautification, and much more. Uh, before we get started, a few quick reminders. First, please everyone put your name, town, and county in the chat. Second, don't forget to mark your calendars for the 2023 All Green Teams Conference on Wednesday, October 18th at the beautiful Cherry Hill Library. Now let's bring in our buddy, Vicki Benetti from Washington Township to introduce tonight's special guest. Hi, Vicki. Hi there, everyone. I hope you can all hear me. Good, good. Um, Chelsea, thank you. And thanks for all that great energy you're bringing to the Oakland Green Team. Um, we know Tri-County Sustainability is a pretty savvy audience and we're glad you're all here tonight. Um, and I'll bet most of you know the difference between weather and climate. Well, that said, it's undeni undeniable that there has been an uptick in extreme weather events around the world and even here in South Jersey. Just in the last few weeks, Gloucester, Camden, and Burlington counties have seen flooding, tornado warnings, and repeated alerts related to poor air quality. Is this climate change? We may get some of those answers tonight. What's the history? And who better to ask than our New Jersey state climatologist, Dr. David Robinson. In addition to being a climatologist, Dave is a geographer who's done extensive research on the Earth's cryosphere. He earned his PhD from Columbia University and he's a distinguished professor at Rutgers School of Arts and Sciences. He's been a member of the National Academy of Sciences Board on Atmospheric Sciences and Climate. He's past president of the American Association of State Climatologists. He's a fellow of the American Meteorological Society and holds a Lifetime Achievement Award from the American Association of Geographers. It sounds like the Academy Awards, I know, but you'll be interested to know that he's also a contributor to the IPCC climate reports that we see that shake us up every year um, <laughs> or every so often when they get all of that information together. That's the International Panel on Climate Change. And uh, we're just delighted that he's been the New Jersey State Climatologist for 31 years. And finally, I have to say that Dave is a co-author of the annual State of the Climate Report for New Jersey. And we'll post a link to that report in the chat. So ladies and gentlemen, let's give a warm welcome to Dave Robinson. Good evening, Dave. Good evening. Thanks, Vicki and Chelsea. 
Uh, I don't know if there's any time left, but anyway, we'll talk for a while. Thank you for the very kind introduction. It's been a good ride. And I am, too, as Chelsea, a New Jersey native. Didn't go to Rutgers, but I've been at Rutgers long enough that I qualify as a Rutgers person. Um, but anyway, I'm pleased to be here this evening uh, to talk briefly. This is only going to be a 20 minute or so splash uh, look through New Jersey's changing climate. Um, you know, I'm going to be a killjoy to start off with. If you were looking before this meeting began, they played something about tornadoes and we've become the new tornado alley and all that. Bunk. Um, I will start by sharing my screen and showing you. Um, something from the state climate website where we have documented, let me see if I can go back, if you can see this, we have documented every tornado in New Jersey since 1950, including two that occurred back in June. And you can see, yes, there has been an outbreak of tornadoes in recent years, particularly three of the last five years. There was that quiescent period in the decade or 15 years before that. But look back in the late 80s and early 90s, there was an upswing then. This is nothing in terms of a trend at this point. Climatologists have to be very patient. Um, we aren't like weather forecasters, meteorologists who get instant gratification with a good forecast, or I should add instant condemnation if the forecast is blown. But you can see here, there is no trend in New Jersey, and for that matter, Pennsylvania or Delaware, in the number of tornadoes in, in the state. So you have to be careful with that 600%. I saw that with your advertisement, and to be honest with you, I cringed. Because uh, it's just not there. Um, there was something about flash flood warnings. Yeah, we've had a lot in the last month because it's been a very wet last four to six weeks. Before that, we were talking drought perhaps coming into Jersey. So there weren't many flash floods. And the fact is, most of our flash floods are during the summer. So again, 66 to three, yeah, there's been a change, but it's misleading because we normally have flash flood warnings in the summer and not in the cool seasons of the year. So you gotta be real careful with numbers and, 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 and such. But let's go and, and start with some PowerPoint slides. And the first one tells the story of, of the incredible, haze, incredible air quality um, that we experienced at multiple times in the last several months. I was at a snow conference over in eastern Pennsylvania and looked across to Delaware at the Route 22 bridge and up into to Lambertville, excuse me, Phillipsburg there. Uh, and we all have memories of that uh, June 7th day. Um, now, that's not climate change, if you will, directed towards New Jersey, but more on a hemispheric basis. Um, it got very warm in Canada early this spring. That melted the snow. I and mean, I keep global snow records. That melted the snow at a record early pace. We had less snow in North America in May uh, than in any other previous May in the last 56 years. And that helped in turn with no snow warm up the atmosphere further and off to the races went the fires once some thunderstorms broke out in Canada and we felt that effect. Since then, the irony is when we've had cool dry weather as we did in May in the first half of June, it brought smoke with it from Canada. When the wind switched around a month ago and came from the warm humid Southwest, the, uh, the smoke mostly stayed away. It snuck in here a few times and we've got warm, humid and rainy. So is this climate or is this weather? Uh, and in some respects, the answer is yes, um, because you can't separate the two. Uh, yes, weather is your day to day goings on, but it is on a built or developed and takes place on a higher foundation now, that foundation being the warming that humans have brought to the climate system. So you don't wanna talk about weather here and climate there, you've got the two interspersed. And I think that's an important take home. So anyway, moving on here, let me get moving on here. Um, welcome from the State Climate Office. If you didn't know we have one, we do. 
Uh, I've had the opportunity to be a state climatologist back since 1991. Um, I was very, very young <clears throat> when I began as state climatologist. And now by five or six years, I'm the longest serving state climatologist in the country um, on record, but including right now. Uh, we have a website, I invite you to visit it, njclimate.org. And you can find all kinds of interesting information there, including that listing and the, the mapping of all the tornadoes right here, and a lot of other tidbits of information. Uh, you can all, and, and as state climatologists, why are we here? Yes, we talk about climate change, we study climate change, but we're here as applied scientists, as an applied institute through your state university, which has research, teaching, and service as part of our tri-fold mission here. And our idea as state climatologists around the country is we know things locally better than folks who study at regional climate offices or national centers, and we have the trust of those in our state, not that you should distrust or mistrust those who are at regional or national centers, but we have our finger on the pulse of what's going on, weather and climate-wise in our state, uh, in a very applied sense. It's not all about climate change in our office. It could be something much more topical and local or recent or whatever, but there's a big climate change component to what we do today. We also maintain a weather network in the state climate office. Some of you hopefully will be aware of, and now you all are, the Rutgers, New Jersey weather network. We have 67 stations throughout New Jersey that every five minutes take the pulse of the weather of the state of New Jersey. And today's weather, when you look back to yesterday, is now climate data. So it's a weather climate connection. Um, but we have many stations in Gloucester, Camden, and Burlington County. And I invite you, and some of our best stations for that matter are there because uh, several in recent years, and that's more like five plus years now, were supported through um, some grants to the Gloucester County Emergency Management Office, but we put in stations in Burlington, Gloucester, Camden, uh, Salem, and Cumberland County. So you've got a real good part of our network down there in your tri-county region and invite you to take advantage of Cherry Hill, West Deptford, Moorestown, Pensauken, um, Columbus, um, Sewell, I, I'm uh, Sicklerville, I'm on and on and on. Um, we just did a little bit of a rehab job at the Sicklerville station today. So don't go look at that data. We've got to clean it up. It says the low today was 32. Uh, that's because some of, and, and 99 hundredths of an inch of rain fell. That's because we haven't cleaned up the record from when our, our techs, two of our techs visited there today. Um, but otherwise, you can look through the network and, as I said, keep your finger on the pulse of what's going on around your neck of the woods on a uh, minute by minute almost basis. Um, so that's our network. Now, some of you may also be aware of our volunteer citizen science Precipitation Observing Program, COCORAS. It's part of a national program, uh, started out at Colorado State University and still run through there and their state climate office. We have about 300 active observers in New Jersey. And you may say, well, that's an awful lot. We don't need more. Of course we need more. Um, you know it can rain on one side of town and not on the other. Uh, I have a, a, a friend who's less than a half a mile from here. I had 1.57 inches of rain yesterday. He had 1.78 inches of rain, two tenths of an inch in a half a mile. That's not much, but you know how things can vary. So we encourage you to sign up. You don't have to observe every day. We ask you to get a standard precipitation gauge. We'd love you to observe every day, whether it's zeros where we can track drought or the big numbers. Um, we have a station up in White Township, Warren County, the Cocoraz station that has had over 16 inches of rain this month. That's about almost four times normal. Um, it just kept getting hit and hit and hit. And you've heard about landslides up there and such. We wouldn't know that number without the Cocoraz observers. Our stations up there at Peak West Fish Hatchery and um, Hackettstown have measured nine, 10 inches of rain, but that big number is only because of volunteers, citizen scientists taking observations. So come on in and join us. Um, now, to climate, I'm going to 
as I said, go quickly through these because we don't have a lot of time. Um, this just one slide is Climate 101. The Earth's climate system is complex. It's encompassed a number of spheres. It's not just the atmosphere. It's not just the sun's radiation. There's ocean influences. And we've all heard stories about how very warm the oceans are right now. Frankly, for me, it's startling how warm they are. Um, the biosphere, forest, field, desert, agricultural land, so on. Um, topography, geology, the lithosphere, mountains and how they influence atmospheric circulation, volcanoes and how they can influence the climate in the short term. Um, the cryosphere, my favorite, I study global snow and ice and the role it plays in, in the climate system. And then look at front and center, there we are, human activities, uh, our factories, our cars, our fields that we plow under and grow things on, and so and, and so on and so forth. So we are part of that system today. Very complex, very interesting, something for most anyone to study if they wish. Um, and of course, New Jersey, you got to love it. I wouldn't want to live anywhere else. We have all four seasons. We have all sorts of weather. We tend not to get the worst of the worst. And the lower left there is the Mullica Hill tornado. Biggest tornado in New Jersey since one in Montgomery Township, 10 miles from me, uh, where I am in Somerset County now, um, in 1990, October. Um, so, But we've not had a four or a five in New Jersey on record. And for that, we should be grateful. We have fires in the Pinelands, but we don't have the massive fires we've seen out west. Um, you know, yes, we have huge events. We have the Sandys. But please remember, Sandy was not a hurricane when it made landfall. It was a little weaker than that. The storm surge is a different thing. It had a huge wind field, so it was more akin to a Category 2 hurricane. Um, but we, there are worse hurricanes. So I'm not belittling what we get in New Jersey. I'm saying we got a wide variety and sometimes we have extremes. That cornfield in the lower right is from early August of 2010. Corn should not look like that in early August, um, but we tend to avoid the worst of the worst, but we get a taste of a lot. And that to me is something I enjoy. Now let's flip right to climate change. Cut to the chase. It's happening. It's affecting New Jersey. And humans are responsible for a significant portion of the recent changes. What do I mean by significant? I would say right now, in terms of change, the vast majority of the change. There's, you know, you can debate till the cows come home. Is it 80%, 90%, 98%? Uh, recent, I'll show a graph in a minute, basically suggests that we began to really notice, we climatologists, a signal of human impact on the climate emerging from a climate system that naturally is very noisy. Uh, one year to the next, drought and flood and a lot of rain and hot or cold. But we began to see it emerge at about 1980. Uh, and from then on, you cannot explain what we've seen globally without humans being involved here. And how do we know it? We have observations. We have simple basic physical physics, the theory, and we have models, uh, sophisticated numerical models run on some of the world's fastest computers that tell us that without human input, our climate system wouldn't look the way it looks today. So let's quickly buzz through there. These are New Jersey temperatures since 1895 to 2022 annual temperatures. <clears throat> the blue line is a regression starting in 1980 and going to 2022. And you can see how the pace of warming in New Jersey has really picked up in the last 40 years or so. And we're warming at a pace of over seven degrees Fahrenheit over a century's time. Um, there's no indication it's necessarily becoming anything but linear, but that's, that's debatable. And you see a lot of interannual variability. The fact is your, your children, and you folks haven't experienced a year in the kids' lifetimes that is co cooler than the average for the entire 20th century. Every year has been warmer than that, one year warmer than the next. I've got some prelim numbers for this July, which hasn't been all that hot, it seems, but 
Preliminarily, it looks like it's going to be around the 10th warmest July, very close to last July. But eight of the 10 warmest Julys in New Jersey since 1895 have been since 2010. That's how much we're warming, not just in the winter, spring and fall, but also in the summer. Um, and it mimics or looks very similar to the globe. As New Jersey goes, so globes goes the earth, the globe, that's what I would say. And you can see the pronounced warming in the last four to five decades compared to earlier in the 20th century. Sorry, this keeps bouncing back and forth with a very temperamental mouse. Um, precipitation, 1895 to 2022 in New Jersey. Uh, you can see from the last 40 years, New Jersey is getting a little wetter, but also the year-to-year -year precipitation has become more variable. We've had the two wettest years since 1895 in 2011 and 2018, but we've had some dry years as well. You look back early in the 20th century, there wasn't as much interannual variability. Now, this poses a vexing issue. We have to be prepared for wet periods, but also dry periods, not just in one particular direction, for instance. Um, but with that increase in precipitation and increase in variability, we are seeing more of our rain fall in heavy events. Kind of my, the mantra is when it rains, it pours. And we've seen that in multiple instances. This month, we saw it with Ida, we saw it with Irene, we saw it with Floyd, which kind of kicked things off back in 1999. And particularly in the Northeastern United States, more of our rain is falling in larger events. Even in areas of the country where it's not raining more, the rain that does fall, falls in larger events. And then, oh yeah, we're a coastal state. Um, and your coastal counties, in a way, with the Delaware there to your to your west, sea level is rising. These are uh, curves taken at Atlantic City and Sandy Hook since the early part of the 20th century, and we've gained a foot, foot and a half of sea level rise. Now, there are multiple reasons for it, um, but the major signal here is from melting of ice sheets and glaciers and the warming water, which thermally expands. There's also some geologic reasons why and some reasons from extraction of groundwater, but sea level is rising um, in the last century. So those are the observations we're talking about. When we're talking theory, we're talking greenhouse effect. And that has to do with greenhouse gases we're putting in the atmosphere from the burning of fossil fuels. You can see the carbon dioxide record there since 1958 on the right. Um, Pre-industrial times, that left axis was down to about 280 uh, in the late 19th century, 280 parts per million by volume. Now we've got higher levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in any time in at least the last million years. And we know it's a greenhouse gas. We know that the earth is habitable because we have a natural greenhouse of carbon dioxide, methane, and in particular, water vapor. So when we add these trace gases to the atmosphere, the water vapor, the methane, it warms the atmosphere. And it's a well-known fact, clausius clapeyron relationship, that for every degree Celsius of warming, the atmosphere has the potential of holding 7% more water vapor and water vapor to greenhouse gas. So you've got these feedback loops here um, when you start adding greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. And this is physics. Again, the earth would not be habitable without a natural greenhouse. So it stands to reason if we add to that greenhouse, we're gonna keep warming. Otherwise we strip away all the greenhouse gases. The sun provides enough energy to the earth to warm us to a frigid zero degrees Fahrenheit. So the natural greenhouse brings us up to about 50, upper 50s Fahrenheit. And we're talking here in a few moments about changing temperatures five or 10 degrees beyond that due to what we're doing, adding to that natural greenhouse. Um, so again, it's like a blanket on a bed. Uh, the sun's energy comes through that blanket and heats you. And, and that heat doesn't immediately go back up into your bedroom because it's trapped underneath that blanket. And if you're still cold, 
you put another blanket on and it holds that heat longer. But does the heat stay there forever? No, otherwise you burst into flames. It eventually leaves the top of the blanket and goes out to space, but it stays near you longer. So you get warm and you stay warm or, or you may get warmer if you add a blanket. So what we're doing is adding another blanket to the bed, which is delaying the loss of that solar energy that's coming in and heating the earth atmosphere system. And it's just a little more difficult to get rid of that. And, and by the way, 90% of that heat is being absorbed by the oceans, which will hold it even longer than the atmosphere. So we've got ourselves in a bit of a fix. Um, and then we have models. I already mentioned sophisticated models. I'll just move on and for the sake of time uh, talking about those. Um, let's look to the future. That's what you're all thinking about. Um, we're going to see temperatures continue to rise. Um, there's just no question about that. If we stop burning uh, emitting greenhouse gases today, it would still keep rising because we have all that heat stored up in the oceans. We're going to keep getting warmer. How much? I'll talk about that in a minute. Steady or increasing precipitation for the mid-Atlantic is what the models show. The moister areas and the higher latitudes getting wetter, the dry areas getting drier. Welcome to the Southwestern US, um, for instance. Uh, more energy in the system, warmer oceans, warmer atmosphere, more moisture in the atmosphere, and with that, more extremes, more storms, more floods. But if you don't have a trigger to get that moisture out of the atmosphere, you'll start baking and, and increasing evaporation at the surface, which in turn will help to warm things up and could lead to more drought. So yes, you can have it both ways with these extremes. You can have extreme drought, you can have extreme wetness, but just the key is more extremes. And in sea level, expect that to rise in New Jersey, another foot by mid-century, perhaps three feet by late this century. But what about temperature? Here's the curves of where it might go in the green and the red. And you go, wow, that's a wide range. Why don't you guys know better? It's because we don't know what you and I are gonna do in terms of our emissions. So we run these models in the future with different emission scenarios. And the area in green is if you run it with lower emissions, we kind of go green-ish. And if we just let things run amok, it will be that red area. And you can see that could be over 10 degrees of warming by the end of this century. On the green end, if we really went and, and carefully got rid of, uh, reduced our emissions, um, it might only be a couple of or three degrees. That's still a lot on a global assist, in a global system. Um, and it's still a lot in New Jersey uh, specifically as well. So the reason the variations are so wide is in part because we don't know what our emission scenarios are going to be, in part because the models still have to get all the system better or more correct. But notice before about 2040 or 2050, you can't see a difference between green and red. We've already kind of, the die is kind of cast for warming in the next 20 plus years. But it's what we do now that's going to have a big impact on the second half of the century and where temperatures go. And that's awfully hard to get across to general audience. You guys are sharp and in tune with this, easier to you folks and to a politician who thinks on two, four and six year timeframes, that's very difficult to say what we do in the 2020s, it's gotta have an impact on our grandkids in the second half of the century. Um, so, you know, that's where the societal issues come into play. Um, this is what seaside heights would look like from above. If sea level rises by a foot, not so much of a change. Three feet everywhere in light blue would be permanently underwater, not just in sandy or whatever. And if it rose 6%, 6 feet, which is an outside probability, you'd essentially lose the barrier islands of New Jersey. And think of what would be coming up the Delaware and the salt front with the water intake north of Philly. Um, and then you throw a little drought on top of that once in a while, and you've got problems in the Delaware Basin, to be sure. Um, very quickly, changes. They're underway. People tell me things are changing. Health officials tell me. Agricultural folks, foresters, they're all telling me how warming, 
Um, less cold in the winter is letting the southern pine beetle reside in the pinelands. The health officials are seeing infectious diseases from the south come up and last longer, longer seasons for them and such, and, and so on and so forth. So these are the changes that are already underway. So what do we do about it? And I think this is a great group to throw out my preachy slide to. Thanks for coming and listening tonight. In a short tidbit, I hope you got a better understanding of what's going on out there. This is all about understanding. And if we can all get on the same page in understanding the climate system and what's changing and why it's changing, then we can join forces writ large and start talking about mitigative efforts and adaptation or becoming more resilient is kind of the buzzword of the day. We're not going to be able to mitigate ourselves fully out of this. I've been saying that for 30 plus years in my classes. Um, we're going to have to learn to adapt and become more resilient. But the more we can mitigate, the less we have to adapt. So let's work on them both hand in hand together. And then it takes leadership. And you guys are terrific because you're part of the leadership core, um, be it at the local level, county, state, national, international. It's obviously knows no borders. The smoke sure taught us that back in May and June. Um, we're all in this together and we need leadership at all levels of, of society to come together about this. Uh, make it as apolitical as possible. All right, my preachy slide is over. Um, now, just a little summary there. I kind of highlighted and read some of the the highlights of what I've been trying to get at the last few minutes, but I'm not going to read them to you. I hate wordy slides. You can ask my students that. Um, but I'll finish with a recommendation. If you want to learn more, there's been some really nice pubs put out by the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection in recent years. Um, and NOAA has put out some good ones. But this is a nice summary. This is the one I say, when your cranky uncle comes to Thanksgiving dinner and complains, say, would you read this 50, 60 page uh, document and, and learn more about climate and climate change? Put out by the National Academy of Sciences. Yes, a committee I sat on there and that's apolitical. Um, and we vetted the first edition of this in 2014 as it was updated in 2020 and the Royal Society. So it's a combination of efforts there. I, I highly recommend that. And with that, I will go to kind of a nice last slide to make us think of the, our nice coastal state. And, and thank you for your attention and your time. I don't know how much time you have. I'll be happy to answer questions here. You see my email address there. I hate to say I live for email or I live on email. And uh, there's the state climate website, njclimate.org. Our weather network is njweather.org. So thanks very much. Dave, that was fabulous. Thank you. Um, I feel grounded. I feel educated. <laughs> and uh, I wanted to just mention to our audience that I had a, just a, a brief exchange with Dave and I said that after he sets the stage for us as he has today uh, we're thinking of having several follow-on presentations to dive a little deeper to get a feeling for what are the impacts of climate change on New Jersey's agriculture for example or uh, what are the health impacts and having presentations that focus a little bit more on some of those discrete subjects to try to bring it all home so, but thank you so much. This has been fabulous. And we will be taking questions. Um, Chelsea, do you want to moderate the questions or start it off? Sure. Um, so please put your name in the chat if you want to ask Dr. Robinson a question. Uh, please try to keep your questions brief and state your name and town. I, I have a question. We have a question, Bill Johnson? Yeah, Bill Johnson. I'm head of the Environmental Justice Committee at Tri-County Sustainability. And um, when you look at the um, heat vulnerability maps on your site, you see that overburdened communities such as East Camden and Burlington County, Camden are listed as high, so high vulnerability. And I have two questions. One is, why is that? Why are, why are, they, why are they so high compared to the rest of the state? 
And my, my second question is, what can we do as an organization to alleviate that, that high yep. vulnerability? Yeah, Bill, um, that's a great question. Thank you for bringing in the whole equity issue that I didn't really have time to touch on. Um, they are heat vulnerable along with areas up in Newark and all the urban locations because there's so little greenery there. You don't have shade. You don't have trees transpiring moisture, which helps to somehow somewhat cool the atmosphere. And, and as such, um, they are warmer. Uh, on sunny days in particular, they stay warmer at night, which is a really big problem because people don't get the chance to regroup before the next day's heat comes along. Now, the whole state's been like that this month. It's the nights that have been so warm. The days haven't been all that excessively warm. But these urban heat islands are, are, are a big issue. So what do we do about it? There are some uh, endeavors underway to plant more trees. I know that in Newark, there's an effort to do that. In Patterson, they're going to produce, uh, in concert with the Nature Conservancy, a kind of a green street, if you will, and put pocket parks in there. So the idea, and, and you may have heard that there's a new paint that's been invented by, I think, a scientist out of Purdue University that reflects a lot of the solar radiation and cools off rooftops and such. So there's more we can do, and the more we have to do um, to equal the playing field a little bit and cool our, cool our urban areas. Thanks, Dave. See a couple more hands up, fire away. Uh, this is Lorraine, Lorraine Prince. Um, I, yeah, I have a question. Uh, it's, it's a very basic question, but it's something that I know I wonder about all the time. Can you help us to understand um, why do scientists disagree about global warming, <laughs> about climate change? Aren't you all working from the same data? <laughs> uh, yeah, but you put 100 scientists in a room, you get 100 different answers sometimes. Um, uh, the vast majority and those in the know, those who are actively doing research, those who are trying to do the science, the pure science, are greatly outnumber those that are still express uh, skepticism, shall we say. Um, but it's just human nature. You're not going to get everyone on the same page. Even I think, you know, I've been doing this for over 40 years. Um, I was doing climate change in the late 70s, early 80s, when people thought climatologists mixed drinks or something like that. No, we were in pure anonymity. Um, and that's become political and you get hate mail and things like that because people bring the non-science into the science discussion. And I think that's the problem. But you're never going to bring any everyone on board with total unanimity. And you probably shouldn't, frankly, for that matter. Um, my interests are just talking to the vast majority of people who want to know more about it, who don't have their minds set in stone already. Um, but, you know, you mentioned scientists, not just the public in general. And the fact is, scientists are humans. Scientists are part of society, and they're not always going to agree on everything. We know that. <laughs> Uh, I see a question from uh, John Sapamara. John, are you there? Yes. Yes. Hi. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Um, so uh, I, I'd like to um, try to find ways to make climate numbers uh, sort of more sensible to the public, more understandable. This um, almost 1.2 degrees Celsius uh, of warming that we've that we've seen so far uh, globally. Um, is kind of, you know, it's just a number out there, but um, yeah. it's it fair to compare it with approximately a four degrees Celsius cooler um, Earth at, during the, the peak of the last glacial maximum? Is that a fair comparison to say, oh, wow, we're, we're kind of more than a quarter of the way, you know, beyond that, essentially to give people, an, uh, you know, an appreciation for yeah. what a degree of global mean temperature is about. Yeah, I, I dare say that might even work. But when you tell them that the earth was just four degrees C colder and there was a half a mile of ice covering northern New Jersey, uh, they might get that idea. And that was only 20,000 years ago. But it is very difficult when you talk those numbers, because on a day to day basis, what's a degree or two? 
it's going to be 97 on Friday or is it going to be 96 or going to be 98? It's going to be hot. Um, so maybe then you have to turn to the big ticket items, but even that's tricky. I've looked at Arctic sea ice since I was a grad student. I can't believe how open the Arctic gets at the end of the summer with sea ice. It's just, to me, it's the canary in the coal mine. But people don't live up there, and they don't know about Arctic sea ice or what's going on with the very low amounts of our Antarctic sea ice right now. So you, you try to paint some examples without taking it to an exaggerated level where they're going to say, you're just cooking the books, you're really minutely cherry picking. So it, 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 it's a real challenge, but I think you, when you start putting it all together, that's when it becomes all the more impressive rather than just picking a number like 1.2 degrees here or there. Um, and then you start talking about the impacts because that's what people are really interested in. I go to a meeting and kick it off, just like you're essentially doing here. I'm kicking it off, but what are you gonna do next? You're gonna to talk to the experts who are being, talk about impacts throughout all different um, sectors who are gonna follow up. Um, I, I would listen to them um, and let them tell you how the seasons are getting longer for infestations and so on and so forth. That will probably hit home better than talking about a degree or two of temperature or 10% more precipitation. Thanks. Great. Dr. Robinson. Marty, well, Marty Levin, a question. I'm, I'm calling in by phone. Unfortunately, I'm in an area with very limited uh, uh, access through the internet. So um, I'm part of the Tri-County Sustainability Green Jobs Group, and we're working on a program to provide training and stable jobs for people being released from jail and prison to help reduce recidivism. In particular, we're focusing on the solar panel installation opportunities. And especially given the recent experience in New Jersey of the impact of those fires in Eastern Canada that you mentioned earlier, David, uh, we're concerned about the fact that uh, a lot of the effectiveness of those solar panels was reduced dramatically in some cases over 50% during those days when there were dangerous amounts of particulate matter in the atmosphere. Do you think this industry has has some legs? Where, yeah, where think, it, it uh, definitely has legs. That, that was pretty short term. We have solar sensors at over 40 of our weather stations, and it looked like dawn at some of these stations in the middle of the day for a few hours there on June 7th. Um, yeah, I mean, there's clouds here, too. This isn't the best place for solar. Go out to Yuma, Arizona. Um, but we still do okay solar wise. So yes, there are going to be impacts. If there's more forest fires, there's going to be more particulate matter in the air and less solar radiation making it to the ground. But I wouldn't let that deter you. I think that's a wonderful program. I think the future is in multiple ways, multiple green paths, wind, solar, and, and other creative tech uh, approaches that are only beginning to be looked at. So I say thumbs up for, you know, pushing things on the solar side of, um, of the ledger. Okay, and, and uh, do you have any suggestions about how our Tri-County group can be supportive in promoting, proponing this initiative throughout the state? Yeah, I, I kind of leave that more to you, except making it clear that we do have enough sunshine in New Jersey to make this a viable proposition. And I think you can talk to people who have solar panels on their homes. Um, you can talk to the Board of Public Utilities and, and they will be able to, or even some of the power uh, networks. A lot of you folks are probably in PSE and G territory um, and, and they would have information on it as well. So, you know, a typical Robinson answer. If I don't know the answer, I tend to know someone who might know the answer. Um, and I'll leave it to them. That's, um, thank that's you great. so much, we, David. Appreciate it. Yep. We have time just for a few more questions, but how about think, Sherry Dudas and then Randy? Randy Orlo? Sherry? I'll be quick. Uh, Dr. Robinson, New Jersey currently has a historic budget surplus of $8.3 billion. How do you think we should be allocating funds to address climate catastrophe? First of all, I think more money should be given to the New Jersey Weather Network. Uh, 
<laughs> we are woefully underfunded with lack of state support for the most part or university support. But um, other than that, I, I think you want to attack the issue with uh, mitigative activities, um, the solar, the wind, um, and, and, and greening the cities um, to, to deal with equity issues and such. There's just so many directions to go. I would just say we shouldn't just put all our eggs in one basket. We should look in multiple uh, directions on how we're going to handle this issue. Okay, Thank next you. quick answer, quick. Randy quick. and then Heidi. Hi, Dave. My name is Randy Orlo, and I am the solar chair for TCS. And thanks so much for being here. Um, so I have a real basic question, only because Bill took my question. Thanks, Bill. Um, <laughs> but uh, as someone who talks to people who, you know, just kind of feel like, oh my gosh, this is so overwhelming. I have family members that are like, you're being ridiculous. What's the easiest thing that I can do as a citizen to help mitigate all of these effects from climate change? And something easy that I can tell my neighbors or people who are resistant to this um, information because they just feel like it's so daunting. So what's yeah, the it, it, it is daunting. And you know, it's one of those things where you have to look in at the cumulative effect. If one person does it, it doesn't look like much. If a whole community does, if a whole nation does. Um, I'll tell when students ask me this, I'll say, um, talk to your parents <clears throat> about turning uh, down the thermostat in the winter and turning it up uh, in the summer uh, for every degree or two. Yeah, you know, I'm not saying don't be uncomfortable, don't get yourself sick, um, but you can make some adjustments that shouldn't impact your quality of life. Because I want to be realistic. You're not going to tell everybody start walking everywhere and turn off your furnace and your air conditioning. Um, so you take, uh, and, and, but you talk about how you save a little bit here. I mean, I often did that when you talk about if you can save a couple dollars a day in lunch, it doesn't sound like much. Multiply it by days of the week and, and, and months of the year, and all of a sudden it adds up and then do it for the whole community. So those kind of exercises um, where you're not asking an, an undue burden on people, but you're asking them to think about what they're doing. I do the same thing with lawn watering with my neighbors, with their automatic sprinklers. Um, I went away on July, June 23rd. I looked at the forecast. I said, I can turn mine off. And I haven't turned them on since. Um, but they're going every morning I go out. They're up and down the block when we've had seven inches of rain this month. You know, it's the, that awareness, awareness, get heightened awareness. Okay, we've got, I see four hands up. Okay, Heidi, you're next. And then Sharonda. Okay. Um, Heidi Ye, I live in Cherry Hill and I work for the Pinelands Preservation Alliance. Um, my question's about the AMOC, the big news this, you know, last 24 hours um, that it could potentially stop um, as early as 2025. So what does this mean for New Jersey? I'd read that the Gulf Stream is holding back about two feet of ocean from our coast. So I was wondering if a slowing or stoppage of the Gulf Stream is ever incorporated into our sea level rise projections, or is that like an additional two feet that could get layered on there? Yeah, great question. AMOC, Atlantic Multi-Decadal Overturning Circulation, or however you look at it, um, it's the conveyor belt that runs through the globe's ocean that really starts with the Gulf Stream going up to the North Atlantic, the waters cool, and they get denser and sink, and flow down deep to the Antarctic and into other oceans. That's the whole idea of this conveyor belt of circulation. Um, and if we slow that down, it could result in a cooling of the North Atlantic, less heat being pumped up that way, and throw off global circulation. We saw it about 11,000 years ago. It happened as we came out of the last ice age. Um, yeah, uh, and with the slowing of the Gulf Stream, more water would slosh up against the Jersey Shore. No, that's not taken into account. I mean, it's understood it could happen, but no one has factored in that it's going to happen. This was a statistical analysis done by, I think, a brother and sister over in Germany. I, I, I haven't read the paper yet, but I've read about it. 
Um, it goes back to the day after tomorrow, if you remember that movie. Um, and that goes back to my professor, Wally Broker in grad school at Columbia, who proposed the idea of stop of this circulation stopping. Uh, and um, he tested that hypothesis on my climate class when I was in grad school in the late 70s at Columbia. So I've been following this since I was a grad student. And it's interesting to see it keep resurfacing. Um, will it happen by the end of the century? We don't know. Um, it's a new way of looking at it. Um, but we have to be aware that I think the take home point here is everything is connected to everything, as I said before, with the atmosphere, but it involves the ocean as well. So, so we've got the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns and everything else, right? <laughs> it, it's fascinating. It's just fascinating. I would love to be around in year 2100. I don't think I'll make it because uh, I'd like to see what's going to happen. But the scary thing, not to get too sentimental or whatever, I got five grandkids, four, three, two, one in six months. Mm -hmm. Hopefully they're all going to be alive at the turn of this next century. And I'd like things not to be too uncomfortable for them, shall we say? Absolutely. Okay, so we're going to speed through the last few questions. We've been leaning on you. Sharonda, are you still with us? Yes, I am. Sorry, going in and out. I'm, I just landed in Atlanta for a conference, but I wear many hats. I am the EJ co-chair for Tri-County Sustainability. I'm also the chapter co-chair for the Greater New Jersey Gateway Climate Reality Project, and I'm the founder and executive director of Operation Grow Inc. And so one of the things that I wanted to bring up is, yes, there are people who live in the Arctic, the Inuit people, their way of life is severely threatened. I was just down at the National Academies for the Climate Crossroads Summit. And one of the things that I brought up, and when we talk about the heat island effect and greening urban communities, uh, I, I really believe we need to pay more attention to why those communities are set up that way. It's really by design. So uh, what do you think, uh, from your perspective, I, I, I have my own ideas, of course, but from your perspective, what would you say about dealing with the, the, the history and the societal ramifications about why these EJ communities are actually EJ communities. Well, you know, they've been hit, they've been hit hard, not just in the US, but globally. Um, they're in very vulnerable areas. And then on top of that, they're more susceptible to climate change because of what's happened to them. And in some cases where they're located, meaning near sea level in some cases. Um, yeah, the Inuit, you're absolutely right. You know, they're amongst our first climate refugees because their communities are no longer being iced in year round. And that's exposing those community to waves breaking on shore and their communities are eroding away because the sea ice isn't there to buffer the ocean. So they are a perfect example of early onset, if you will, um, climate change refugees. And, and in the cities, I mean, in urban areas, people have put the most toxic things in the most vulnerable areas. So people are experiencing, really, it's a double jeopardy. Uh, and the only way we can do it is heighten awareness and get at it and attack these things. And remember, it's not an equality issue, it's an equity issue. Okay, we have patient Bobby Hastings, patient Ed Meadlock, and patient Catherine Fisher. And then we're gonna ask you to enter your questions in the, in the chat after, when we if we can't get to you. And we will ask if um, Dave can answer them at some point in the future or someone in his office can, okay? Bobby? Thank you, doctor. Um, I guess after just hearing what you said for the last 50, 50 minutes, um, the, one of the questions I wanted to have for the Tri-County Shade Tree uh, group is assisted migration. You know, right now we're losing some every tree that we have in New Jersey. And, uh, you know, you know what's going to happen. We're going to lose our canopy. It's going to get warmer. Uh, any research into assisted migration as far as it comes to the trees? Um, Moving things from a hotter area to us. Yeah, yeah. No, I, that's, you know, I've I've... I've talked to agriculture community about that with peach trees and you know different cultivars of those. Um, but can we have a massive planting program to bring more southern species of just regular shade trees to the north? I don't know. Um, you know, you've had 
so many different blights over the years. I don't know what they'd be bringing with them. Um, remember, our latitude isn't changing, so you have to worry about other impacts besides just temperature. You have moisture issues that may differ and also um, sunlight, the amount of sunlight they get. So I, that's basically, I'm getting outside of my realm beyond that, but it, it's worth discussing. Um, but I think for the meantime, we just need to get more shade trees in there, but wisely choose those shade trees. But it goes beyond just are they Southern cultivars? Are they going to rip up sidewalks and streets and then have to be ripped out? There's so many different factors. Are they going to be subject to the blights that are already here in this area? I took every tree on my block two years ago, and you can guess what trees those were. Um, <laughs> so anyway. Okay, well, we'll have to do a follow-up on forests, impacts on forests. Yeah, absolutely, okay. bring in some forester. Great, <laughs> great. Okay, Ed. Dr. Robinson, uh, inside that block. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I, we've been in La Nina for like three years, and now we're in, in a transition to an El Nino in the Pacific. How do you see that impact in our fall and winter? Okay, it was a little dicey, but you're talking El Nino and La Nina, short term climate variability. Uh, we have had an unusual three years of La Nina, um, and we have transitioned in the early stages of an El Nino. The waters in the eastern tropical Pacific have warmed considerably. Um, and with that, it's unsure if any of the impacts we're seeing across the globe this summer have a direct connection to that, but ultimately they should. And ultimately, we know that El Nino years tend to be some of the warmer years atmospherically because naturally you're burning uh, warmth into the atmosphere, plus the greenhouse effect on top of that. Um, here in New Jersey, there's not a huge impact from El Nino. Um, there could be in the fact that it generally cuts down on the number of hurricanes in the tropical Atlantic, which would minimize a chance of one getting up here. But the Atlantic is so darn warm right now that that might actually counter the uh, impacts of, the, uh, of a low, um, a low tropical year in the Atlantic Basin from shearing winds that come out of the Pacific. So we'll have to see about that. Uh, otherwise, we tend, we tend to get more coastal storms during El Nino winters and more inland storms during La Ninas. And those storms are generally wet, but some of our dry, wettest winters have been El Nino winters. Some of our least snowy winters have been El Nino winters, uh, 1998. But occasionally, if things just line up, we can pop a big snowstorm during an El Nino winter. So the, the take home is El Nino's real wet in Florida. So if you go to vacation in Florida this winter, it's probably going to be wet. Out west, not so sure because La Ninas tend to be drier. But look what happened in La Nina to California last winter. So not a big signal in New Jersey. That's the take home. I am so glad that we're recording this because there are so many more things in the answers to the questions. Okay, Catherine Fisher. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Robinson. I'm Catherine from NJLCV. So uh, forgive me if this question is too broad to answer in a quick uh, soundbite. Um, we're unfortunately in a place where a lot of people simply don't trust scientists, unfortunately. Um, is there any way that you think that we can fix this problem? Is it just a PR thing? Can the science community do something to try to build trust? Um, I know it's a big question, but um, yeah. I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Um, yeah, uh, just briefly. First of all, New Jersey is a very well-educated state, and there's less pushback in a state like New Jersey than elsewhere. That's all I can say from talking to my state climate colleagues who have had things thrown at them in other states when they've gone to talk about climate change. Um, but there's still, you know, some distrust out there that people think that um, because you're talking climate change and what to do about it, that somehow you're some socialistic whatever, whatever. Um, climate uh, scientists are just, as I said earlier, they're too persnickety um, to get too caught up in that. Um, and they love what they're doing. Um, I think part of it's communication. I'll just put it at that. Um, 
I get out there and give 50 talks a year. I teach 400 students a year. That's a start. My colleagues, Rutgers has a climate resource center. Rutgers gets out there. Rutgers is trying to do something on campus about the climate issue and, and the environmental imp, uh, footprint. I was just at a, uh, a workshop yesterday on campus about that. Um, so I, it's just getting out there and communicating. People have to talk to each other and, and you get to know people and maybe there the, there'll be more trust. I think it's gotten better in the last couple of years, frankly, but it's had its ebbs and flows over the last several decades. So just got to get out there and keep talking about it. And notice, I've said the word understanding multiple times tonight. I have not once said the word believe. Don't ever ask me if I believe in climate change. I understand climate change. Belief is something's different, in my opinion. And I don't think it's semantics. So don't talk about believing in climate change. Talk about understanding it and then doing something about it. Well put. Okay, our cleanup question for the night. <laughs> the last one, Mike Richter, you've been waiting a long time. Go ahead, Mike. We can't hear you, Mike. It looks like you're muted. Oh, dear. Well, oh, so sorry, Mike. Maybe you can, you know, type your question into the chat and uh, we'll try to get it answered if we can. Uh, we heard that somebody lives by email, so we'll see. <laughs> Oh, you gave yourself away. Uh, <laughs> um, I can't. Uh, I can't tell you how great this has been. How great foundational education, getting us on a, a playing field where we feel we can, you know, go to first, second, and maybe even third. We're, you know, this is really good, and we'll take it from here. And Terrific. probably ask you back. <laughs> Terrific, but, and thank you again. Thank all of you for what you're doing. Getting out there and trying to do something about this. It's so darn important, rather than just a talking head like me. Can you hear me now? Talking about, so thank oh. you. Uh, Mike, yes. Yeah, yeah I'm uh, sorry. I, I really want to squeeze this question is because it's so important. It has to do with human health. We're talking about the effects on the earth and our climate. We're not talking enough about the effects that we see on patients coming into the emergency room every day with asthma attacks and other effects of air pollution. And this was my profession for many, many years. Mm -hmm. um, we have in New Jersey, the best kept secret, which is the limit on motor vehicle idling. And nobody does anything about it. Um, so Dave, from your position, could you possibly have any influence on the administration to both publicize, you know, the carrot and stick, publicize as well as enforce the limit on motor vehicle idling. Yeah, I, I don't know about that. I mean, that's a DEP issue in some respects. And I do sit and chair one of the subcommittees on their science panel. Um, but interesting, you bring that up, the health issues and such. I'm working with the Rutgers Health Institute uh, on a couple of projects that are looking at heat and health uh, involving air pollution, a study with Harvard, Rutgers, uh, and so on and so forth. So there is work being done at Rutgers on climate and health issues right now in concert with other universities. We're even working with colleagues in Taiwan. And if you think the air quality is bad here, um, the, we had to redo the scales of our graphs because there's so much more pollution over there. New Jersey was doesn't show up on the graph, but there is active research uh, in terms of that idling. Um, you know, I was involved some with a study with diesel emissions from trains idling in stations or in rest areas. So uh, it is being looked at within the Department of Environmental Protection. So if I hear something, I'll say something. Okay. Well, thank you. Um and uh, you've mentioned communications a couple of times. And uh, 
I would like to give a plug to your website. The Climate Center has great resources on it, uh, some tools that you can use to visualize what the impacts, for example, of future flooding might be in your community and that sort of thing. So, you know, that uh, videos, number of things for education and, and for information sharing. Yeah, that's the Rutgers Climate Research Center. Uh, I'm affiliated with it and all, but that's not directly part of the Office of the State Climatologist. But right. it's all, we're all family at Rutgers. A big family, and you do wonderful work. <laughs> but thank again, you. thank you so very much. Okay. Have a nice evening, everyone. Thank you. Bye -bye. Stay cool. <laughs> bye bye. Yes. Yes. So we're going to uh, let Dr. Robinson go for the moment and uh, maybe just hang in here for another moment, if you will. There's a little bit of unfinished business. Uh, when we met last meeting two months ago, we had some discussion about our potable water quality. And uh, we talked about its sources, quality, some of the threats that we know that we, um, we have seen and read about and uh, got a lot of information about some of the contaminants that are in some water supplies, like PFAS. Uh, one of the things that we suggested is that we take a minute and go back and look at our consumer confidence reports uh, or call your your water authority or whatever. And I just wanted to circle back and see whether anybody had an opportunity to do that. And if you found out anything about the source of your water or the quality of your water in the intervening time. Anyone, if you wanna put something in the chat or suggest anything? Leon Lackwitz, I saw you raising your hand. <coughs> okay. <coughs> So I checked out Mantua's uh, MUA and they have seven wells, luckily, <clears throat> and, most, and luckily uh, none are under Cohancy. However, they get 10 to 20% depending on the season to make up for a shortage from the, uh, <clears throat> from New Jersey water. And my question, one of the questions is uh, <clears throat> the uh, Mantua MUA uh, pulls their water. However, the results you get are for the uh, water that uh, comes out of their well before they blend it. So one of the questions in my mind is what's the quality of the water from uh, uh, <clears throat> New Jersey water. And uh, I went and I looked up the information on PFAS and basically they, well, of course they do. They claim that they're on top of it. And uh, if and when they locate it, they remove it using anionic uh, uh, <clears throat> ion exchange resonance and activated carbon. So, uh, however, <clears throat> I try to locate the results for the water from this area and I uh, wasn't able to uh, determine what, where the water comes from. I assume it's from the Delaware, but uh, there, there's really no information. But since uh, I mentioned PFAS and I, was unlucky and didn't uh, hear your presentation two months ago. Did you discuss uh, how much PFAS comes from uh, cooking ware? And does it leach out um, when, when the, uh, when the uh, cooking ware is new or is it a persistent and there's continuous leaching out? We so, discussed, uh, uh, we had a presentation that actually um, listed many, many sources of PFAS, one of them being cookware. Um, and uh, some of them are, are worse than others, although we didn't go into great detail on cookware. Uh, but that presentation is posted uh, on YouTube. Uh, and and uh, I would commend it to you. I think it's, you know, it was uh, pretty comprehensive. So. 
And I happen to know Leon's a chemist, so he'll really get into it. <laughs> so um, all of this, of course, is uh, re uh, recorded on our YouTube site. So you can take a look at that. I think I heard Isla laughing. Is that yes. right? Hi, Vicki. How are you? <laughs> um, I actually have a copy of um, our CCR um, from Marlton, um, also known as Evesham. And um, they have a nice little write up on a couple of things in the CCR. And one of them is where does the our water come from? And um, just to let everyone know, um, the sources um, in Evesham are a blend of groundwater and treated surface water. We draw from um, two aquifers mainly, um, the Potomac Raritan Magathy, did I say that right? And mm -hmm. Winona Mount Laurel. Um, the very interesting thing um, that always kind of shocks me and makes me a little nervous is that um, in 1996, um, the Isham MUA water allocation was reduced by 22% to um, the aquifers. And then so to supplement um, their water supply, they purchased drinking water from um, Mount Laurel Township and um, the and New Jersey American Water Company, which um, comes from the, the Delaware River. Um, our CCR for um, 2022 um, that came out, um, our MUA says they're happy to report that our drinking water met or surpassed all requirements of the Federal Safe Drinking Water Act, SDWA, every single day in 2022. So that's what I, that's what I found out. And then if you look at the, um, if you look at the CCR, you can, it's hard to see here, but there's detailed tables in it that show um, the various things that they're testing for in the water and, and whether or not it's um, in violation, yes or no. So that's it that I have. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I'll just add something. If there is anything detected, it should be listed. There will be sampling for things that um, don't show detections and so they won't be listed. But if there's anything that is detected, it should be listed in there. So that's really good. It should be comprehensive. And that's a great source of information. Thanks, Isla. Anyone else want to talk about the water? OK, well, let's. Uh, I, I would just suggest that it's not too late to check out your, your water supply. Um, we count on it every day. And, uh, you know, these are things that are good to know. It's your source of water. It's what's in it, uh, how it's treated, how it's delivered. Always good to know. So, thank you. All righty. All right. I guess me. we will we'll cut it off here for the night. Thank you, Chelsea. Yeah. Um, so I want to thank everyone. And uh, we're at the end of our scheduled time. And thank you so much to all of our guests. And don't forget to join the TCS Discord. This meeting recording will be on the TCS YouTube channel tomorrow. And don't hesitate to contact us via info at tcsahub.org on Discord or via social media.